Welcome everybody. I'm Michelle Anderson. I am a um, I've been a professional clarinetist and teacher for many years. I although I love playing, I think actually my passion is teaching. I really love teaching people. I've been lucky enough to study with some amazing teachers throughout my history, and I like to go to master classes and things to pick up stuff. And I've really been experimenting with um, how to teach as effectively as I can. You know, if I see someone struggling with something on their instrument, how can I help them get through that as quickly as possible? So really my purpose here today is to help you as much as I can. If you have questions along the way, just feel free to ask because I want this to be, I'd like you to leave here today with either if you're a player, some pointers that you can use to work on making your own playing better, especially if you're a teacher, just some ideas that will you can try out with your own students and see how they work for you. Okay, so um, first of all, I, I want to thank um, UBC and WinFest for inviting me to be here. It's really fun and Bakuna Musical Services for sponsoring us here today. We're going to talk about how to effectively teach clarinet. So to me, this is kind of our dream as a teacher, right? We want to we want to really inspire our students so that they love making music, they enjoy their instrument, they learn with enthusiasm rather than, oh god, I gotta go to my clarinet lesson, that they feel proud of their achievements, they're not frustrated, and we all know as musicians that we beat ourselves up about our own playing, and, and our students will do that a lot. And so I really think it's important for us as teachers to help people not beat themselves up and to identify it and to figure out how to do that. And we want them to have confidence in their ability to learn. So I spend a lot of time with my students um, trying to notice where they're telling themselves they're not doing well and turn that around to say, you know, boy, a lot of people have trouble with this. You know what? There's really step-by-step -step systems you can do to fix it. And when they fix it, say, oh, isn't that awesome? That now you know how to do this. Three weeks ago, this was really giving you trouble. That means this other thing that's frustrating you, it's exactly the same. You're going to be able to learn this and get better so that they feel like they have momentum going. So how do we help them? Um, so as I was just saying, we, as there's some practical clarinet stuff we need to know for teaching clarinet. You know, what are the most common problems our students experience? And what are some great ways to help them overcome it? And even though everyone's a unique person and a unique player, the truth is there's probably like seven or eight common clarinet problems that everybody has to some extent. And so knowing those as a teacher will really help you teach better. I think as a teacher, the second one, motivate them by giving them a curriculum that gives them tangible improvements. There are some things that can take a long time to improve and other things that we can improve really quickly. And I think as a teacher, we want to have a little bit of both of those. It's really important that someone can go home from a lesson and say, I did that one thing better today, I feel excited to be here. So and we also need to be able to assign sort of short little exercises that we know are going to, I think the expression is move the needle. If they work on this one thing for a week, they're going to notice that they've improved on it. So we'll talk about some of those as we go through. Finally, I think a great teacher is a psychologist. Think of all your best teachers. They're the ones who help you understand the right mindset for music. That um, it's so much of our success is related to our attitude, and as a teacher, we really need to be their biggest cheerleader um, and help them overcome their own doubts and insecurities along the way. So this first section, I'm just going to share with you some of my favorite teaching pointers when I'm teaching clarinetists. The first section is the, the beginners to intermediate level players, so let's say less experienced players. And I've, I talk to so many young clarinetists, this is what I call my list of what the most common complaints I hear. I and mean, we've probably all as clarinetists had these complaints about ourselves. You know, it feels hard to blow. I squeak, it's so embarrassing. I squeak in the concert, everyone looked at me. My high notes don't work, my fingers don't move quickly enough, my notes don't come out, my tone sounds bad, and then like clearly I suck at clarinet. Right? That's, that's the biggest one. That's the biggest one, yeah. And like this comes out so commonly, this oh, clearly I just suck at this. Um, so as teachers, we need to be able to handle all those and help find an empowering counter to each of these statements. So let's look at these. Um, one thing that kids won't identify, but it's one of their biggest problem causers, is that they're playing on a reed that's not the right string for them. When you're sitting down with a student one-on-one, -on -one, it's pretty easy to quickly diagnose this and get them on the right track. But even if you're invited to go out to a school and maybe do a master class and you have you know, 20 young clarinetists in front of you, I think this is worth um, looking at, and I'll show you how I do that. So the problem with the reeds, not, not necessarily this, right? 
or that the reed is too soft. And this happens because they started playing clarinet and their band teacher said, you're going to play a number two reed or whatever it is. And they play that for two or three years. And as they've become more advanced player, they're still on this really, really soft reed. So there are some pretty easy ways to identify that if you want a quick snappy thing. If I have a master class of 20 kids, what I'll say, if, if they can play in the high register, so if they've been playing a year, they usually can, I'll ask them each to just play a C scale in the high octave, tonguing up to the thumb and register key. This high C thumb register key is a very reactive note. It's a great one to use to diagnose what's working and what's not. If they have a soft read, um, let me demonstrate what this could sound like. And it doesn't sound great, but these are some of the, the clues you'll hear on, on someone who's playing on a read that's too soft. Right? And that's so common when you get a group of kids, and if you're and I'll just have them go one by one, and I'm making little notes as I'm watching them, and one of them is like, I just have a little code, and I'll say, what's your name? Oh, I'm Jonathan, and they play it, and I'll write, oh, SR, soft read for Jonathan, so I know I can come back to Jonathan and help him. That undertone is a sign there's not enough support for the note. Now, of course, support comes from air support as well, so it could be that often they're not using enough air support, but it's a very strong clue that their read is too soft. So. That's one of the easiest ways, and as players ourselves, if we get that undertone in high notes, the way that I'll test it with a student is I'll say, may I just see your read, and I'll pick it up, and I'll move their read higher on the mouthpiece, maybe, maybe even like a millimeter above the top of the mouthpiece, and I'm going to say, this is going to be a little hard to play, and we're not going to leave it here because it's not ideal, it's going to be a little hard to blow, but I'm just curious if those high notes come out more easily, and almost always they'll go higher with more way less effort than they did, and we've just made it easier for them. And I'll say, okay, the solution is not to take your two and move it that high, but you should be in the two and a half or a three. You're ready to graduate to the next size. And that can make a huge difference to how easy it feels for your students, so definitely worth checking. Um, every mouthpiece setup works differently, so we can't say this is the read strength you must have, but if you wanted a guideline, by the way, feel free to take photos of any of these, or if you want to send me an email after the session, I can I can email you all these PDFs if you want the whole slideshow, so it's available for you. Um, but beginners, two, two and a half, as soon as they play any high register notes, they have to be on at least a two and a half, I think, or they're going to be working too hard. When I was just saying hygiene up, they should be on at least a three, and most high school players will level off between three and a half and four. So our job as a teacher is just to help our students to make sure they're on the right one. Um, and I just showed you that. Okay. Other quick things, you know, make sure they have a decent read case. It could be an inexpensive one. Um, everyone has their own system for breaking in reads. I'm sure you've been taught one. I, I won't go into huge detail on that. Other than, um, I find if the cane read gets kind of see-through on the tip, it's a sign it's a bit waterlogged and it's kind of toast for that day. It's not going to work well. For me, I usually find a brand new read does that more quickly than one that's been broken in. So um, again, sometimes you'll be working with a group of students and they've been playing for half an hour and someone had just put a new read on and it's see-through and it's totally wimping out. And what they feel like is, oh god, I can't play, something's wrong with me, I suck at clarinet. Right? But sometimes it's just their reads waterlogged, so you just show them, oh, your read looks see-through, time to put a new one on. So teach them about rotating through reads. Things that we take for granted as clarinetists that our students don't know, we need to teach them that. Um, all right, second thing. This, this is a fun one because you can look like a rock star. You can make a huge difference in how someone sounds with one change, and that's the optimum head to clarinet angle. I used to have some teachers who insisted they had the right angle. It's 37.2 degrees, or you must line up with your knees, or you must be this far outside of your knees or this far in. Everyone had a different one. What I realize is we all have a different optimum angle. It's because of how our teeth are shaped. But here's my examples here. I love the girl in yellow. If you look at her clarinet, the two pieces are sideways. The reed's upside down and her hands are backwards. So, lovely photo. <laughs> um, but the picture of Benny Newman there, it just, he, he's modeled so many great habits. Like his armature is great, his hand position is great, and the angle of his head, his clarinet is really good. So I just, it's a great picture to look at. This guy down here is really representative of what a lot of young players look like. And the most important thing I want to draw to is the way his head is looking down, and how 
how dangerous that can be for us as clarinetists. Um, for one thing, if we put our head down and just speak, hello, hello, we can feel that we're restricting our throat so the air doesn't work. But the angle our head makes with the mouthpiece really affects how the air moves through the instrument and the sound that we get. Um, and if I'm showing this to young kids, even if they're beginners, like especially beginners, like, wow, oh, that clarinet is really cool. They want to see what their fingers are doing, so they get used to looking down. And it's they all want to do that, and I'll have to say, you know, look at me and say hello, and they say hello, and then I'll say, let's bring the clarinet to you without moving your head. And even then they'll go, hello. <laughs> I'll put their head down. But you can play with your head down. I'll just play with my head up and then move it down without changing the angle. It's a profound difference in sound, even if we're on their typical first five notes. <laughs> much more difference if we're in the high register. So this guy here, you know, the way the angle his clarinet's making with his knees looks pretty normal, so that might not ring alarm bells, but his head is down. If he were to straighten up keeping the angle the same, it's as if he's playing out here, which was not good. So what you do with your students is simply have them, if they're really young, just have them play an open G, have their fill in all the way, you know, too far, and then slowly put it out and hear where the optimum range is. If they're playing in the higher register, do it on a high C just because it's so much more reactive. You just kind of And you can see where the range of good sound is. And if someone is sitting, you can you can have them notice was it at the end of my knees? Was it just past my knees? Was it just inside my knees? In general, I find people with an overbite do better with their clarinet pulled in. People with very um, even bottom jaw and top jaw do better with their clarinet out. That's my generalization. But you just need to find that ideal spot with your students. It's not like there's one spot, but usually there's about a bell width where when they're in that range, they're gonna sound their best. And it can make a huge difference to a student instantly. Um, voicing. So getting into slightly more advanced concept, but I try and teach this as early as I can with my students because it makes such a difference. By voicing, we mean what our tongue is doing inside of our mouth when we're not tonguing. Um, so this is Joe playing clarinet, and normally our tongue likes to sit on the bottom of our mouth. If we're teaching a, a classical model of sound, sort of a symphonic sound, which most school bands and orchestras would imitate, that's not the ideal position. Um, Having said that, if we're doing music that involves a lot of pitch bending, if we're doing a lot of jazz or klezmer or folk music with, with a brighter, more flexible pitch, then it's our tongue moving around a lot that changes it. But for the most part, when we're teaching our students, we want our tongue fixed really high, like the second picture. The best way I've found to teach this to my students is have them say the word he, like I'll have you guys try this, but to whisper it in the loudest hiss, like you're saying, try it. Just, and that should feel familiar to how you play clarinet, to some extent, what your tongue is doing now. It's, it's very abstract to just say to a student, I want you to play with your tongue really high and arched in your mouth. They'll be like, I don't know what my tongue is doing. It is, it's very, very abstract. But a fun exercise for them, out on the thing here, it's fun because it, you are giving them permission to make really bad sounds on purpose, which they like, um, is to take the high C and have them play um, with their tongue high, saying he, this is an x-ray of my tongue here, saying he, and then hey, and then ho, and then ha, he, and that, that's, saying those syllables takes us through the circle, and you do it on a high C, which is so reactive, and you'll hear the change, so let me do this, I'm going to, um, I'm going to make, this is the x-ray of what my tongue is doing, so you can see what's happening. Most people don't. 
it's amazing how quickly my sound gets really offensive. It's, it's, and that's me blowing with normal air. Just moving my tongue around. Many people are in A, just a little bit off. And what you hear is a bit of a bright sound, a little bit flat. So if you can get them to just lift it a little bit, they get a much better sound. So it is abstract. Whispering key helps them. There's one other tool you can have them do that really helps them. It's to sit down with a tuner. I wish I had a tuner on screen. I'll play those four notes. So high G up to high C. This is like your guaranteed diagnosis if the tongue is low. You pulling out a tuner, right? Yeah. Okay, can you hold it up? Oh yeah, hold it up. Okay. Thank you. So whatever, whatever, like maybe my instrument's warm or cold, if my G is a little sharp or flat, I'm not worried about that. What I'm looking at is the direction the tuner goes as I go higher. And if my tongue is low, um, so make sure everyone can see that, guaranteed it's gonna go flatter. It went so low that it went, it thought I was playing a sharp, the next note down. But did you see how the ball dropped? So wherever you are, if they're going up and it goes more low, that's a sign. So then what, so what you can do is have them slur through those notes, and if the ball's too low, then really have them try and lift it up. So let's say my tongue's dropping a bit. So it's to get it back in tune there. If, if, so that's, that's your clue. Thank you, Mike. That's really helpful. I appreciate that. So have your students do that. with, And, and that way, they don't really have to know what their time is doing. They just do what it takes to play in tune. And the byproduct is they have really good voicing. So it's one of the best ways for them to work on it. Of course, the, the bigger answer to that is when our tongue's in the right voicing, we produce a certain sound that hopefully we really like, and our ear starts to identify the sound. And once we have a clear model of sound, what we want to sound like, our body will tend to do what it takes to sound that way. But, but sometimes you need something like a tangible thing, like a tuner, to help them know if they're in the right spot, and then they start to identify what that sounds like. So really nice exercise to use. All right, tonguing. Um, if you're teaching a total beginner, you can save them so much pain on tonguing. So I'll, teach, I'll show you how I would teach a total beginner how to tongue and then how I would help someone who's maybe got some bad habits to fix them. Um, I think if they can, there are some things if they get right away, it just makes life so much easier. We all have a natural tendency when our tongue moves to have our air move it to change when our tongue changes. So if we're just slurring on clarinet, for the most part, we just sound like a human air hose. Right, good, fast, steady air. When we tongue, our body likes to blow differently. We like to explode at the start of a note and then fade. And this happens um, instinctively. We just do it automatically. I've never heard a beginner not do that. Never. If there's some kid out there somewhere who's going to do it someday, but I've never seen anyone not start by going. So I usually, before I even like let them tongue on clarinet, I'll describe that. I'll say, hey, we want to be a human air hose. And what I'll do is I'll say, take a finger, so you guys can try this, and I want you, while you're blowing, to tap your finger on the hole. I'll say, see how it's making it sound like we're, we're making different sounds. Maybe I'm doing four sounds. It's almost like four notes. But I said, my air is still playing one note, but my finger is interrupting it. And then I'll say, what this actually is, it's inside out tonguing. It's like I've ripped my tongue out of my mouth, put it outside my body, and it's blocking the air. And this is what we want our tongue to do from the inside. So then I'll have them whisper. In a lot of band classes, people are taught to use the syllable to or do, which works for most instruments. If I'm teaching clarinetists, I'll have them say T, because then we're encouraging the voicing right away. So I use the syllable T. I'll have them blow and whisper. <sighs> Maybe do four where they're patting it, and then four where they're trying to say T. So it'll be <sighs> And really listen for t, 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 t. Let's try it. Yeah, so let's do it all together. So we'll do four like this. One, two, three, four. Now we'll speak it. Two, three, four. 
And you can hear their airstream when they're doing this, especially if you're hearing kids going on. And you know, I'll just say, now listen, that you're not hearing that little pause. And this is what I'll say. Then I'll have them. So instead of trying to analyze with the student, oh, well, the tip of our tongue is going to hit near the tip of the reed. We can do that, but I find the easiest way to teach tonguing is just to say, hey, I want you to put your clarinet in your mouth, and those of you who have clarinets out can try this, and, and shape your embouchure. And although this is going to feel really weird, I want you to speak T T T. And I'll demonstrate with my voice being really non stop so that they're associating that kind of continuity of sound. Let's try it. Yeah, and inevitably what happens is the right part of their tongue hits the right part of the reed. You don't have to analyze it, they're just doing it. So if, if you're teaching beginners, it's just the best way to teach them. Then you have them whisper, as, as we're doing here, where you just tell them to blow loose air and whisper it. You can hear the tongue hitting the reed. And then I have them morph from whispering into playing. And I'll say, here's my tongue, here's my x-ray. And usually I'll have the kids do it one by one, and I'll listen for that. And I'll say, you know, I think you're stopping blowing, let's get it continuous, and they'll, they'll pick it up really quickly. Actually, those of you have clients, try the morphing, just on your own, just kind of... It just says how you can demonstrate that and teach it. Instead of on the read, yeah, and I've had a couple of students do, and it was hard for me to kind of explain. Yeah, so there are a few like common mistakes that kids will make tugging on the roof of their mouth. So two common challenges: tongue not hitting the read properly and stopping blowing. Um, I think I have that on here. Maybe so I'm just morphing it or moving ahead here. Okay, no, I don't have. So I'm just going to give you a description. The yeah, along with hitting the roof of their mouth. Some students will not even use their tongue at all. They get used to huffing, sort of ha, ha, ha. And some kids are so good at it, it's hard to tell that they're not tonguing or that they're not hitting the read. Um, that whisper thing we were just doing is one of the best ways to diagnose if they're doing it, because you guys can hear this sound, right? If I'm quiet, you should be able to hear my tongue physically hitting the read. And so when you have a kid who hits the roof of their mouth or uses their throat, if you have them speak, you'll say, can you feel your tongue hitting the reed? And if they don't, then, then you say, just put a finger in your mouth as if you're playing clarinet. Now, can you feel your tongue hitting your finger? And their finger will feel this squishy wet thing hitting it. And they're like, oh yeah, I am hitting it. And they'll say, that's exactly what, you know, you'll, you'll hit the reed. It's the speaking. Um, a huge part of our job as teachers is to identify the bad habits our student has and you know try and replace it. But keep in mind those habits are really ingrained and really powerful and their brain will resist changing it. Even if they're even if logically they know, oh my tongue's supposed to hit the read, they've conditioned themselves. So we have to do what I call brain interrupt. We have to find creative ways of them. You can't just, if you've been tonguing wrong, you can't just will yourself, even if you understand the theory, to do it differently. You can, it's not efficient. Shaking up the brain. So the whisper technique is enough like clarinet playing that it's helping create a new habit, but it's different enough that they can change more, more quickly. So we, we try and find ways that are similar to the way they actually play, but are different. Um, so whispering, it allows you to hear if they're hitting the read. And you can even say, can you hear yourself hitting the read? The best I found is morphing from whisper to real. And sometimes even then, let's say they were a huffer, they'll do this. So like I maybe did one real tonguing, and then my brain went, oh, I'm playing clarinet. Time to huff. Ha, ha. And so you'll hear it, and you go, you know what? Hmm, I think you're still in that. Let's see if we can hear your tongue. But it's the best way I've learned to fix it is that whisper technique, because it's a new brain pattern for them, but still kind of modeling the best habit. So whatever the problem issues are, that seems to fix it. Okay, is that making sense to everybody? All right, good. Fingers. Um, so 
there's a ton that we can talk about with hands and fingers. I just want to share with you though some of the things I use with beginning students that I think really make a difference to them. First of all, it's just the shape of hands. Um, I've seen lots of good ways to show it to kids. I love working on this with total beginners before they have time to learn bad habits. Um, so one way is you just let your arms hang loosely and just kind of bring them up like you're going to shake hands. Yeah, notice the shape there and they tend to be arched fingers, which is just what you want. The other thing kids really like is I'll say, oh, let's make finger puppets. And generally the shape we make in finger puppets is a really good clarinet shape. So then I'll show them, oh look, our fingers are arched. They're pretty loose, pretty relaxed. Um, you see on the left side, I have holding up my finger straight and then on the bottom one, I'm sort of squishing it in so this first knuckle is bent. It's one of the most common bad habits we see with clarinet fingers. And probably one all of you have encountered in your own playing at times where it was sort of squished like that. It's really hard to move our fingers quickly. You can have a, a kid just kind of you know put their fingers on their knee and then tell them, okay, now squish that knuckle in and do it and they'll feel how it slows their fingers down. Um, so that's just as we're teaching them, we really want to focus on that. The other thing I'll say is our fingers have a hole where they like to stick and our job is to keep them as close to that as possible. Probably the biggest problem students have is their left hand. Um, most people learn in a band or a clarinet book that introduces open G is the first note and maybe they'll go down to their middle C. And when they introduce A, it's all by itself. And they'll look at the fingering chart and go, oh, I pressed this key here. And they'll just instinctively touch it like that, like the way we cover the holes. And we all know as clarinets, that puts it way out of position to get back to cover that hole. And by the time they actually get to songs where they're not just going from an open G to an A, which is how the books introduce it, they program this, this bad habit. So here's how I like to teach A. It's kind of a silly way to do it and it works great. I'll have them play their low C. Now depending on how long their fingers are, if their fingers are long enough to actually hit the A key already, like to be touching it, I'll have them do that. Some little hands won't quite make it that far, but if they can, have them do that. But here's the exercise. I'll have them play a low C and then pop open the A key while they're still playing a low C. This is a nonsense note. It might squeak, you might get nothing coming out, and I'll have them do it ideally in front of a mirror so they can see what part of their finger is hitting the A key. If not, I'll just say, feel. Notice what part of your finger is hitting it. Obviously, not playing a note, but it really trains that finger to, to be in a position where it's really easy to cover that hole because we are covering that hole. Then the next thing is I'll have the morph where I'm going to say, okay, your bottom finger has to stay on the hole, but you're going to morph where you're going to let your other finger start to come up. So you're going to start doing that. So you're just gradually having them slur, but keeping this finger down. The reason I have them keep the third finger down is young clarinetist hands love to fly. These fingers like to go way up high and their wrist likes to twist. We really want to watch left hand wrist. By keeping that third finger down, um, their wrist doesn't move. And if you're, you're looking in a mirror, you want to say to them, let's have your wrist not move at all. My wrist is just as still as I can make it. Um, there's nothing wrong with actually having your beginners play the A with that third finger down all the time. Later on, you can tell them not to have it, but there's nothing wrong with it, and it, there's so much right about it, it really helps them anchor their left hand in a really good position. Because one of the next things they're going to do is someone's going to say, you're going to play a C major scale, and they're going to try and go from A up to high B, that dreaded crossing the break. And most of the time their trouble is because their left hand is not getting back to the hole. Our left thumb is also a huge part of that. When you first teach them how to play an F, make sure their thumb is actually touching the register key, and that becomes their default position. Because otherwise they're going to play like this. And then it's really hard for them to use those keys when they need to. So um, just, just right from the first time they learn those notes, you want to teach them those things. So that's basically what we just talked about. Um, you know, with both of our hands, you want them to, to sort of see a straight line from wrist to forearm. And you don't want it to bend this way, and we don't want it to bend this way. So on a more advanced level, those are the things we talk about. A lot of kids will... Um, use the side key to rest the clarinet on their finger, which 
puts their wrist in a really awkward position and then it makes it really hard for them to cover those bottom holes and it also tilts it up too high. So usually, sometimes I, I forgot to bring them, but those big jumbo erasers you can stick on the end of a pencil, sometimes I'll stick one on this key and I'll say, if you're hitting that eraser, your hand's not in the right position. So sort of encourage them to get their right hand down a bit so that their bottom finger can cover that giant bottom hole, which is really nice. Oh, yeah, good one. <laughs> you're meaner than me. I'm a soft, cushy eraser, but yeah. We're going to inhale your finger if you're bad. <laughs> okay, here's a quick little pointer that can really make a difference to the comfort of a student and how fast they play. It's true for all of you, actually. Um, if you have an adjustable thumb rest, Everyone's hand is different. I've seen some teachers who recommend your thumb rest should be really high and oh, your thumb rest should be really low. Through this is different for all of us. So everyone just make a puppet with their right hand and then kind of um, close your fingers on your thumb wherever it feels natural. Great, and then just point it towards me so I can see. Cool. Okay, so we have a wonderful variety in this room. Um, here's what I'm looking at. Where does your thumb like to hang out in relation to these two fingers? For some of you, like Maya, you're totally under your index finger, all right? Uh, Bob, you're kind of like right in between the two. Someone over there was mostly under there. Yeah, you were more under your middle fingers, right? So wherever is natural to you is where your hand's gonna be most comfortable when we expand it onto your clarinet. So someone like Maya, whose thumb likes to be on her index finger, should have her thumb rest as high as possible. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Robin. So for you, you want your thumb rest as low as possible, probably to be more in line with what's natural for your hands. And so if you have an adjustable thumb rest, um, you should experiment. Do you? Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And I would think for you, you should experiment. You might even be more comfortable lower. Like it's just really notice what your hand is natural at. Now, many students have a fixed thumb rest. They, it's not adjustable. If it's way different from their natural position, it's going to be giving them trouble, and you should definitely recommend they get their thumb rest replaced. About 25 bucks to get a thumb rest that you can adjust. Or thinking the Lord just get a honking huge pad or something like the, is that the Kuhnman? That's uh, the Ridden Hour one. Oh, the Ridden Hour, yeah. Something I did with an older clarinet is I actually flip the thumb rest upside down. Oh, smart. Yeah, so if you want to go higher, absolutely. And a good technician can actually move the thumb rest to drill two new holes. Yeah, and I had that done on my other thumb rest. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Either you don't need any thumb rest necessarily. It's just getting it to the height for your hand. But, um, so all of us in the room who play, who've experimented, know it makes a difference. If you haven't experimented, and that doesn't tend to change much as you grow, in my experience. Like when I've seen my students once we get it set, if they're 10 years old or 11 years old, when they're 16 years old, they, they still do the same thing. So um, that, we don't tend to change much on those things. Okay, so we've covered tons of stuff here. Um, I'm gonna just very quickly talk about embouchure. If I'm teaching to total beginners, I, I like to keep it simple. I just say, there's three steps to the embouchure. Of course there's more, but like they can remember three things. Um, what I'll say, the first thing, is just to make sure they have enough mouthpiece in their mouth. And uh, what I'll often say to kids is, you know, when we play, the reed vibrates like a lot. And we want it to vibrate like crazy. Everything we do with embouchure and nerves to get the reed to vibrate more. If we have just a little, teeny bit of mouthpiece in our mouth, we're only letting a little bit of the reed vibrate. So the more we put in our mouth, theoretically, the more vibration we get. And I say we have an invisible squeak line on our clarinet. The closer we get to it, the better we sound, and we cross it and we squeak. And, it's simplifying a bit, but it's enough to work with younger students. And you can have them just take a note and um, play it with a tiny bit of mouthpiece, a bit more, a bit more, and listen to what happens, keeping everything else the same. So very clear that you probably heard, and then I'll, and I'll ask them, what did you notice in my sound? You know, and I'll say, oh, you got louder, oh, it got clearer, which is true. So you can get them, especially if you're working with a group of students, there's always some with very little mouthpiece. When I have them do that little scale at the beginning, you know, I'm writing down read too soft, read trouble. I'll put MM if I think that could benefit from more mouthpiece. So there's hand positions, I'll write little things, and then I can, in the course of the class, go back and hopefully help each student a little bit. Um, I do teach teeth on the mouthpiece. I think double lip is fine too. So however you're trained and you want to teach, it's great. I don't have a strong 
feeling about that. I think articulation is easier to introduce when kids have their teeth on the mouthpiece because they're a little more anchored, but either one is good. Step two. Yeah, Mike. Can I throw a little, just a PSA out there because I, I do those beginner clinics for the fifth graders and the elementary schools where they're trying this for the first time, and I really want the kids to play the bass clarinet. And so often, they'll, the first time they'll try to play it, they just can't get a sound or it does nothing but squeak. And that squeak line is the, like if you, if you only got 10 seconds to convince a kid whether the, that instrument is gonna make them feel good or not, find the squeak line. And the bass clarinet, it's, it's like, like that's, the, that's the difference between the kid just thinking the instrument might be great for them or walking away kind of sad and going, oh, well, maybe I'm not good at this. I can't play that. Yeah, and they give up really quick if they... That's a really good point, yeah. And also, those kids playing it for the first time, maybe if they're trying instruments, the other thing they'll do if it feels hard, they'll go, okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and they're going to try hard, and then they, they bite so much, sometimes they'll close their read off, and they'll be like, <laughs> oh, I suck at clarinet. <laughs> and they'll just say, oh, it's really soft. You notice you just close it, let's open your mouth wider. But, yeah. Anyway, the most important part of the armchair, I think when we're talking to kids, um, oh, there we go, talking about biting. Okay. Oh, I'm going to back up. So I'm getting ahead of myself. So just before I get to this slide, um, the most important part, I think, of embouchure for kids is that they get their bottom lip trained properly. So I'll show you how I do that. What I'll say, sometimes I'll demonstrate the world's worst embouchure because I'll say, remember, we want the reed to vibrate as much as possible. If we have blobby stuff in the reed, it's not going to work. Here's the world's worst embouchure, and I'll turn sideways so they can see it. You know, they like, there's no way this reed can vibrate. And I'll say, now, of course, none of you are doing that. But sometimes we have elements of it. And um, so what I'll do is have them take their two fingers, and you guys can try this too, put just the edge of their top lip over their teeth to hold it, and take their other hand and literally pull the skin down away. So it's like our top hand is anchoring it, and our bottom finger is trying to pull everything away from our top finger and just smooth it down. And I'll say to people, this is the direction you need to train these muscles to go. And you need to know that some young students literally cannot do that un unhelped. Their muscles can't do it. Sometimes some kids will look at that and they'll go, oh, you mean like this? And I'll go, okay, you're a perfect clarinetist. Lucky you, you know? <laughs> but a lot of kids are like, you know, and, and I'll sort of turn sideways so they can see this profile. If a really common bad habit kids will do is they'll get set, but when their clarinet slides in their mouth, so does their whole bottom lip. Mm -hmm. And then they get a convex shape instead of concave. So watch for that. That's why this finger thing helps. But from my own experience, one of my first teachers was a really excellent clarinet teacher. I was really lucky. And my embouchure was awful. And I learned lots of things from him really well. But after a year and a half of studying with him, I still had a really crummy bottom lip. And he was getting extremely frustrated with me. And every week he'd say, just do this. And I'd be like, <laughs> and I just, I, and I knew I was supposed to do it. I couldn't get it. And finally he, um, he said, you know, put your hand in your mouth. And I did. He said, shape it. He goes, take your free hand, pull it down and hold it in place and try playing. And I was like, all right. And, and he would sort of show me the difference between you know, how it would clear up the read a bit, and he made this huge fluorescent sign saying, pull your lip down, and he stuck it on my music folder, the one I had to play in school band. It was like really obvious. And he said, how many times in a rehearsal do you put your clarinet in your mouth? I'm like, wow, you know, I've got a couple of wires rest, I pull it out, we put it in, the teacher talks, I said, I don't know, 60, 70, and how many times do you have band this week? I was like, four. He said, great, so you're going to have about 250 times to practice this before I see you next. And he said, every time you put it in your mouth, do that. And, and I was really embarrassed because all my friends were like, what's that sign thing on your folder? But I did. So for a whole week, I just, every time I put it in, I pulled down. And the way the human brain works, if you're pulling on a muscle to do something unfamiliar, it activates neurons in your brain to say, we want this to do something different. And it's, it's like a stroke victim loses the ability to move and a physiotherapist will move those fingers and that tells the brain we want to do this and new neurons, new synapses are formed. So for me, I had to literally teach my muscles how to do it. One week of doing it at band with an embarrassing sign on my folder 
Um, I walked back in, and the teacher had kind of forgotten about this, and I started playing. He said, whoa, what did you do? And I held up the sign, and he just started laughing. <laughs> He's like, oh, I didn't think that would work. <laughs> so it was awesome. And it was very weak. I couldn't hold my good embouchure at that point after a week for more than 10 or 15 minutes, but that transformed it. And there, you know, forever after, I kind of know what that feels like now. So you have to be creative with your students. And the embarrassing sign worked really well. All right. I have a technique here, if you're not familiar with this, I suggest you take a photo of it or memorize it. It's one of my absolute favorite tools to use with clarinet students, and it's great with advanced students. It's even great for those of you in the room to use for yourself. Um, so it's called the embouchure tester, and you can see it's kind of like fingering your high E, except our third finger's up. What this actually is is a really volatile alternate fingering for the high G sharp. This sits on top of the staff. So really, I've, I've only actually used it for a G-sharp once in a really bizarre contemporary piece. But what I love about this, it's a tool your students can use to diagnose common problems in their playing. It doesn't like to speak. So um, one of the most common problems our students have is biting a little bit with an embouchure, especially advanced students. And sometimes they're just a little bit biting. And so we might notice, hmm, they're just not as smooth in the high registers I'd like. Or, they're a little sharp, or it's a little pinch sunny, but it's not so clear cut. If you bite at all, this note will squeak. So here's me biting a little bit. Maybe I sound okay. A little bit biting, I try that fingering. It squeaks like instantly. The most common thing it does is it either squeaks or we get this sound. Uh, an undertone. Um, so just out of curiosity, those of you with clarinets, just try that fingering and see what you get. Some of you will get G-sharp, some of you will squeak, some of you will get Students, it's almost always biting. 
if fingers are not covering the holes all the way to squeak, so with really beginning players, that's super common. Where you'll see it with your advanced students, they're playing along, everything's sounding great, and then they see that bar where the red alert starts to go off. Oh crap, bar 56 is coming. <laughs> and they see, start to see the red alert goes off, tension goes, and that tension often will carry through to our fingers, and then fingerings are covers, covering the holes all the way, and then we squeak. So if advanced players squeak, it's that tension that usually comes from our brain freaking out. It can be biting tension, it can be fingers. All right, so if we're teaching more advanced students, this is what they'll say to us. My tone sucks. I don't sound as expressive as I would like. I can't move my fingers quickly enough. I can't tongue quickly enough. Flute players are doing it way better. <laughs> I suck at <laughs> clarinet. <laughs> okay. these, are, these are the stories that we tell ourselves. So you as a teacher, some ways that you might deal with that. I mean, tone is, is crucial to every instrument we play, right? And the truth is there's so many models of beautiful tone out there. So you as a teacher, you're not necessarily saying sound like me, but you're saying, I want you to sound what's beautiful to you, and I need to give you the tools so you can do that. Let's assume we've got the basics of embouchure, head angle, voicing in place, which are crucial. Then usually, at an advanced level, if they don't have good tone, there's still air support issues or they don't have a clear model of how they want to sound, really, in their mind. So they kind of think, yeah, I don't sound good, but I'm kind of, but I'll say, well, well, is there some player you really like? Who do you want to sound like? I don't know. So you have to have a model in mind. So here's how we can help them. Um, there's tons of great air sport exercises. Any of you who've been trained on clarinet, you probably have some already. I want to share with you some of the ones that are less common that really work for me. So out of many, I picked two favorite ones for you here. The whisper technique we were doing with tonguing is an, also an awesome tool to use for helping people play more expressively and smoother and with deeper air support. So let's say you have a student playing something and it's just a little bit uninspiring. It's a little unexpressive. Um, I don't know, let's just say I'm playing a random phrase. And I'm just kind of playing it without much thought. And a student's doing that, and I, I'm like, yeah, I don't know, I don't think it's there. So, so there's two techniques we'll use. One of them I'll talk about later. But if it's an air issue, I'll say, you know, I have a feeling your air is not supporting the music that's in you. I bet you have a beautiful idea how you want that phrase to go. I'll ask them to whisper it. And the rules for whispering are that they do it as loudly as possible, and that we listen for smoothness of air. So at first they might do this. You kind of hear I'm accenting each note a bit, and I'll say, do you notice that? You, we got to watch for that. You know, we all tend to accent. So let's move it out, and I'll say it's definitely not loud enough. And now it's a little bit too, and it might squeak. Um, if they're really not getting I'll say, let's play a scale together. If they're doing the whisper technique properly, and you're doing a scale at medium speed, you're only going to be able to play about four notes, and you have to take a breath. In fact, I'll have you guys try this in a minute. And the idea is we're just now using this as a human air hose tool. It's just a breathing tool. So those of you who have your clarinet set up, do a two octave F scale up and down as loudly as you can, even if you have to breathe after three notes. Let's, let's yeah, let's do it on your own time. Be louder. so good they jump. They're like, wow, what happened? <laughs> so it's a really powerful tool. Usually what happens is they jump, and if they're still playing, they're like, I couldn't be sounding that good. And after three notes, their bad habits back. Because they, they don't believe they sound that good. So it's an interesting process. We need to help them through it. So whisper technique is awesome. The other thing that um, I wrote huffing down, this is a technique I've been experimenting with, and I've certainly borrowed from lots of other teachers, but the last two or three years I've worked with it a lot, and it's the most effective thing in my teaching for advanced and, and intermediate and advanced students right now. 
It's experimenting with how we use our air by having people blow little bursts of air. And I use it in lots of different ways. That picture has me sort of holding my belly. So um, I'll show you how I introduce it to a group of people, and you can do variations on this with your students. Um, I'm looking for a piece of paper. We'll borrow this one. So what I'll say to students is there are, there are tons of schools of thoughts out there on how to support air properly, whether it's for a wind instrument, for singers. There's lots of good ones, and I'll say to you, whatever works for you is what you should do. This is different from how some people teach air support, and I think it works really well on clarinet. So if it's different from how you're trained, try it, see if it works for you. So I'll say, put a hand on your belly button. You can do that, sit up. We're gonna, um, we're gonna really consciously flex our ab muscles out. And I said, this is gonna feel really weird, especially with kids, they'll start giggling, they'll think it's really silly. And what I'll say is, I'm gonna give you a pulse, and I want you to, in rhythm, pulse your ab muscles out four times. So let me show you what this is gonna look like. Push, 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 push. It feels strange, usually kids will laugh. So I'll say, let's do that in time. Three, four times, one, Two, so push out on my beat. Some of you are good now. Look around the room, about two thirds of you, or about a third of you are going in. We want to do the opposite. We want to push out our hands on the belly button to feel that we're pushing against our palm. So it's out, out, out. Feels weird. And this is not a natural exercise at all. This is contrary to what we think makes sense. Then, except for babies, I know. The um, way babies right? I have a student who's a, a doctor and she says, Watch him breathe. He does exactly what you're trying to teach him. You're so right. My, my first teacher said that watch a baby breathe, and at that time I didn't have a baby, so I didn't get it. They're, they're perfect. Yeah, so this is two pieces of paper. I'm challenging myself. Then I'll often have them hold a piece of paper if you have a piece of paper, straight arms length. And I'll just say, we're just going to blow four blasts of air, and we're going to try and move this. So we're going to do it in time. So I'll just I'll demonstrate it. I'll go. <laughs> So let's add a group. Did you have paper hold? Otherwise, just really, really loud blasts of air. Um, don't cheat. Don't bring it right to your face. Have it far out. Here we go. Three, four. And usually everyone's pretty good at that. Now, sometimes you'll have to encourage them. Now, I'll just get a little more. Then I'll say, okay, here's the tricky part. We're going to do both at the same time. So as we're blowing out bursts of air, you're going to really exaggeratedly, consciously stick your abs out. Let's try it. Three. Now, if you're not doing this, like people will start sucking in, you have to encourage it. Does anyone feel like they get a little more oomph when they are doing that? Yeah, it can be very powerful for getting a really fast clarinet air speed. So that's like the little warm-up exercise that gets them. The hand on the belly helps to make sure we're actually pushing that hand out actively. Then I'll have them do this with their clarinet. This won't sound good, and I'll tell them that. I'll say, this is not how I would perform clarinet, but we want to train our body to get used to this feeling of I'm pushing my abs out while I blow. So I'll basically do the same thing I was just doing paper with clarinet in my mouth. I'm just going to take an open G and huff it. I might be overblowing. My tone might not be great. And I used to, I used to have a teacher who said, never make bad sounds on your clarinet on purpose. But actually, this works, so I, I do it. And it might not sound great, but I'll put a hand on my belly button. I mean, the idea is just, are we pushing our belly out when we play? And if I put a hand on your belly, so you can try it. Unconsciously, right? So this is how we form good habits, but you need to create 
short focused exercises for your students that they'll have success on. And doing what we just did, if this is new to a student, after a week you can hear a huge difference in their tone. Um, I had a very advanced student who was great. He worked hard, loved him, he did all sorts of stuff, and he came into one lesson and pulled out a piece of music and the difference in his playing was so incredible. I had to stop him after he played about three bars and I said, I'm sorry, you sound like so good. What, what, what have you done? And he turned bright red and he said, this is kind of embarrassing. I said, well, what? He said, that huffing exercise you've been telling me to do for six months, I finally did it this week. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're kidding. And he's like, no. And it was incredible, the difference. So I, I kind of assumed he had been doing it all along, but was like, yeah, I know. So a powerful exercise. All right, the other thing I'll do with huffing, um, if you have an advanced student and they have an interval that's tricky, so let's say, let's say we're playing Brahms Sonata and you have C to that high E flat, right? So hard for students. So often you'll get either a or you'll get right? they'll blast out there. It's hard for all of us, right? So any hard interval using huffing can be a way to help um, program our body to handle those intervals a little bit more easily. So here's what you'll have them do. Let's take those two notes, and I'll say you're going to huff between them. Ha, ha, ha. And, and as you huff back and forth, I'll say I want you to try and get them to match. Get the, the tone to sound similar. Get the dynamic to sound similar. So at first, those notes are going to be quite far apart, but it's amazing how quickly students on their own are able to calibrate those notes. So at first, you might have... Back, but guide them through it so that they're not just thinking they suck the clarinet. 
you know, of course, tell them about great concerts. Listening to recordings is great. We don't want to, again, copy the people on the recordings, but we want to have models of sound we like and have them play along sometimes with recordings is fun. Sometimes I'll just say read chamber music and I'll just play along with some random recording that's good. And so I'll play trios and quartets with other people and just kind of, if I'm just in the mood for something fun. All right. Those of you who saw Yora Feynman's you know, lecture, he's really talking about playing from the soul and very, very beautiful. And I think that we're not good teachers if we're not helping students to, to bring out their vision of the music, what, what to them feels like the way the music should sing. And keeping in mind, sometimes a student's idea of a phrase can be very different from your own, you know, but it's really important that they develop it. And there are some practical, technical ways we can help them to develop their voice. Um, first thing is I often have my students sing a phrase. And especially if they're playing something and it sounds kind of boring, and I'll think, are they thinking of this as being boring or do they actually have a really good idea? And if they sing it and it sounds beautiful, then my job is to point out the differences in how they sang it and how they're playing. I might say, wow, when you're singing it, it sounds so joyful. You're making those notes really short and bouncy. Gosh, when you're playing it, I'm hearing more of a funeral march, ta, ta, ta. When you're singing it, it's boom, boom, boom. Let's see if we can you know, get you playing the way you're singing it and we'll sort of help with that. Or if they sing it, well, actually, usually people will not sing a boring thing for me. Usually if I'll ask them to sing it, I'll say, I just kind of want to hear what your phrase is. They'll, they'll stop and they'll look puzzled and they'll go, I have no idea how I want that to sound. I'll go, yeah, that's kind of what it sounds like when you're playing. Let's get an idea, you know, let's, so then you can explore it. But do you think this should be happy? It should be sad. And then we just explore it and then have them sing and then we have them play it. Um, you know, with younger students, Sometimes I'll assign someone to pencil in every single dynamic crescendo and diminuendo that they think they want to do, just as an exercise. And I'll say, you know what, that's today's expression Friday. You might want to change it, but let's at least have a guideline so we can practice having that music come out of the clarinet. Sometimes the clarinet's a filter. The music's in our soul, it's here. Something happens when it goes through the clarinet and it comes out not quite the way we want it to be, right? So we want the clarinet to enhance it, not to block it. Um, I will use subdivision as a tool to help my students. So let's say, for example, they're doing a pretty classic classical phrase where they're getting louder, they're getting softer, they sing it, we identify, gosh, sounds like the way you sing it, but you think this is the high point. They'll be like, oh, yeah, I do. I'll say, okay, you know what? You're not convincingly crescendoing to that point. I, I know that's how you're hearing it in your head. It's not coming out of your clarinet. You know, let's look at that. So maybe they're playing that simple crescendo. but it's, their air is not very smooth. What I'll have them do is subdivide it into smaller units, and I'll say, I want you to subdivide it, and every single note has to be a little louder than the one in front of it. And there's something about repeating one pitch that lets us hear it. If they played it as bumpily as I just did, they'll usually do that the first time they subdivide it, too. It'll be this kind of inconsistency. Every time they change notes, it's louder, and then it backs off. And that's, again, our air, <sighs> accenting each note, which we do unconsciously. When I can get them to just really make sure each little note is getting louder than the one in front of them, then they start to notice what their air is doing. They start to feel like, oh, my air really is actually doing a smooth crescendo here. And then they play it as written, and it's often so beautiful, and it matches the, the musical vision in their head. So that's a tool you can use to help your students um, bring out that musical phrase that's in their body that they're not playing. Because air is so, so important to that. The other thing we talked about earlier is using the whisper technique. Um, you can put some of these together. That subdivision that I was just doing, I can whisper the subdivision. It's even harder. In this case, it's not the rule of as loud as you can. Usually when I use whisper technique, it's like as loud as you can do it to really get those going. It just, then they find their fingers can float on this river of air, and it's much, much smoother. So that, those are some of the tools we can use. We're not teaching them expression, but we're teaching them how, for that beautiful vision they have, how to make it actually come out of their instrument when it's not doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah, awesome. Okay. Um, 
I'm just going to touch on a couple very, very brief things that we've covered. Actually, I'm going to skip over finger technique. We, we talked about hand position already. I'm sure many of you, if we look at this, um, playing technical passages in different rhythms, have done some variation on this. It's one of the best ways to, again, interrupt the brain patterns, right? If someone's having problems on a spot, often they program mistakes into it, or I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. To me, this is one of the most important things we can do as a teacher, is identify where the red alert is going off in their brain. And this is the spot of music where they're going, oh crap, here comes that hard bit. And we all have it, we all do it as players. I'm playing along and all of a sudden, oh, there's 156. <laughs> and what we want to watch for as teachers are two things. One is the physical tension that goes off when the red alert is going off. So with fingers, so commonly we can't play a finger passage because part of our brain said, oh, this is hard. And then we tensed up and our fingers started smashing. And then they're not covering the holes all the way, so it feels like it's delaying. And then we say, this is harder than I thought. And then we start smashing even more. So it becomes, uh, has anyone ever done that as a player? Maybe it's just me. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. yeah. So um, as a teacher, we need to identify those red alerts. And the other thing is the psychological red alert. Like, I suck at technique. Or it, it, and we just so often as musicians, we'll blame ourselves and say that we suck at clarinet. Or we suck at whatever we're doing. Um, so when you identify a red alert, you need to interrupt their brain pattern. You as a teacher have to find creative ways to do that interruption. If it's a fast technical thing, what I'll often say to students is, okay, let's just look at the first five notes of that pattern. You're now going to make it into a beautiful slow way to it. So, I don't know, let's say I'm doing favorite concertina, right? Go. That little arpeggio section. And let's say it's just, ah, my tongue's not working. I'll say, this is now the most beautiful, slow thing in the world. You're going to stand up, you're going to sway, and you're going to play it really slowly. And just, you know, enjoy it. Whoops, sorry, my reads. Cool. Just very slow and relax. I'm just going to have them play with that. I don't care if it's breathy, just play it in a different character where it's easy. And what you're going to say in their brain, you're going to ask them to repeat the words, it's easy to themselves, almost like a, a mantra. And you do that a few times. Our brain's used to the red alert going off, and now we're trying to reprogram that. It's easy. Yeah, it's not so bad. That's one technique. It's kind of goofy. That isn't going to fix them for life, because they're going to go back to fast, and the red alert's going to go off. But that's the first technique we use. The next thing I sort of call working backwards. So let's say it's that little arpeggio. Um, we're just doing the first couple of them. What we're going to do is just take the last two notes and play them just two notes quickly. And you can have them just play it eight, nine times. It becomes pretty easy. When we just have two notes, we can actually calm down quite a bit. And again, blah, 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 oh, it's pretty easy. And I'll say to them, well, you're pretty good at that, aren't you? Now let's do the last three notes. And if, maybe, maybe we even have them slur it first. And you're going to look at their fingers. As soon as you see the smack, you're going to say, oh, just want you to finger it. Look at your fingers. And make them really relax. Do they not? Do they? That's not so hard, is it? And they're like, oh, yeah, it's not so hard. Okay, play it that way. Now, usually after you've told them to relax their fingers, they're going to play and it's going to sound like this. I go, wow, yeah, your fingers look great. Isn't that interesting? When we relax our fingers, our body gets so relaxed, you also relax your airstream and it kind of sucked there. But no, don't use the word suck. But you just say, so can we have our airstream be really energized and our fingers be really relaxed? And then we go to four of those, right? And it's amazing how when they're in that state of relaxation, the notes can come out. We know it, they've worked on it, they've probably worked on that hard bar zillions of times, but all they've done is practice it with the red alert and reinforce their mistakes over and over. So you as a teacher, you really need to look for that and um, come up with creative brain interrupts. I'm sure you must do that as a conductor. Yeah, it's like, great to hear that. Like it. creative... Yeah, yeah. You, several things you've already been talking about. Like, yeah. The airstream separate from the brain. And, yeah. yeah, and so it's just a, a really... Part of the fun of teaching is the creativity we get to use of, gosh, I see my students having trouble with this, how can I present it in a slightly new way so that they can get rid of those previous mistakes in there? Um, so 
there are a couple other things on this list, but what I'm hoping is that some of these real clarinet tools that we talked about here, you can use as a player yourself, some tools to identify that some sort of philosophical things here are helpful. Um, if any of you want these slides, I'll also mention, I, I have a YouTube channel that has like 100 videos on about how to teach clarinet, little specific topics. So if you're teaching someone or if you're a player and there's just something that's giving you trouble, there's probably a video there. You can just go to, to YouTube Clarinet Mentors. I also recorded a set of series for Bakun music that are designed for how to teach specifically. So, you know, how to put it together, how to take care of it, what reach the students use, how to correct common tone mistakes and more advanced speaking. A lot of stuff we covered here today, but they're just kind of one topic videos. Um, so you can look at the Bakun music YouTube channel. All of these slides, if I, I have cards here if you want to pick them up, but my email address is really easy. It's michelle at clarinetmentors.com. If you want me to email you the PDFs of the slide, I have them in one file. I just, I meant to have a link here to it, and I, I don't, but I'm happy to send it out. Um, and I'm also happy to answer questions. We're, we're sort of two minutes to 3.30. I'm going to linger beyond that, but does anyone have questions right now for me? Anything? Yeah. Where do you begin taking your students from like fairly slow articulation, 80 beats per minute or so, and then getting them to like flutter into the fast mm. and pushing them past that break? So, yeah. Um, my favorite tonguing exercise, I'm going to see if I can teach it in one minute. There's videos that have it a little bit more, is when I'm trying to teach speed to students, rather than focus on speed, I will teach them how to stop tongue and have them focus on shortness. Mm. And I find if they can play really, really short, the speed is a byproduct. And it's like, we almost don't have to focus on that, that will come. But I give them a five step exercise. One is just playing an open G with, with great air. And that's to train them to notice their air is nonstop. Kind of like the inside out tonguing, then I'll have them just do legato tonguing. So here's the tongue. Half the time they'll, and you correct them. Then I'll say, okay, your tongue's great at starting notes. Now we're going to teach your tongue to end notes. And I'll have them go half on the reed, half off. And I'll demonstrate it this way. And I'll say, I want you to keep blowing even when you're blocking the reed. And I'll say, I'll realize you're not actually going to play like this. You might get air leaking up the sides of your mouth, but it's great training. And we want to have them listen to the ends of the notes so that they match each other. So at first, they might be a little uneven. You might hear something like this. So that there you exist, but eventually we get where they're getting a clean ending, blowing the whole time, and then I'll say, great. Now, imagine there's a rubber band holding your tongue on there when it comes up, it's going to spring back, and you make it as short as you can. And this is an exercise, let's say your tongue might not be that great, we're just going to make it really pecky. It's really important they do this slowly. Because if they start to go fast, instead of ending the notes, they're going to start going. They're just starting the notes, but at fast speed. We want it slow enough that you can hear space between the notes. And in order to play it short, their tongue has to move really fast. It has to come off the reed and come back. This is teaching them to keep blowing the whole time they're tonguing, to move really fast and rest. Move really fast and rest their tongue. Then I might take them through a scale and have them play a long note so they're reestablishing the air and then the same pitch for short 16 notes. And I'm emphasizing, I'll say overdo it. This is an exaggerated exercise. Make it as short as you can. You know, even if it's really pecky, it's an exercise. And then have them turn on a metronome and see what their fastest comfortable speed for doing that is. So it might be 60 or something. And then I'll have them turn the metronome up. But their focus is how short they make it. If they start going, they're going to go, yeah, no, you're not really ending the notes. You're just starting them. Let's really get that shortness. If they really get the concept of playing it short and they're committed to it, and they do that for a week, they're going to come in with fast, smoothly faster timing the next week. And after three weeks, I've seen them raise their metronome marking of what they can do in 16th. I was like 20, 25 beats, you know, to, it's amazing how much you can build speed by not so much thinking about speed, but thinking about shortness. 
And so that's kind of morphing, taking them through the process so that they can single tongue very, very fast. Um, like most people should be able to single tongue 16 at at least 120. Mm -hmm. And when they start working on this, it's often 140, one, you know, 144 can happen. So it's a really cool way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check your metro. Let's be good. I don't know. Um, any other any other questions from anyone? No. So thank you all for being here today. I I think being able to teach others is a huge gift. Not only do you be a teach, but I also find if I'm teaching someone and I'll be talking about their error, part of me is like, oh yeah, I should be doing that too. Like it really will sharpen your own game as a player when you're teaching someone else. You'll you'll refine what works and you'll make your own playing much, much better too. So thank you all so much for being here.